Thank you, Jonathan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's, it's a real thrill to be here at Drury. Uh, it's funny, Jonathan and I have been talking about having me here for ages. I mean, literally well over a year, year and a half, I think, since you first talked to me about it. So it, it's really great that, I, that I'm finally here. So we've only got about an hour or so, so what I'm hoping to do is uh, I'm going to talk for about 25, 30 minutes and then open it up for Q&A and conversation after that because I think it would be somewhat hypocritical of me as a quote-unquote social media guy to do all the talking and none of the listening. Uh, but still, I think it's, it's, it'll probably be helpful for me to go through a, just a bit of the history of, of who I am and what I do just to give you some uh, more context. Now, first of all, you may have noticed when Jonathan introduced me, my title at NPR is Senior Strategist. It is a very weird title. It is not one that you typically see at a news organization. And the title is intentionally uh, cryptic because the type of work I do at NPR was not something that people at news organizations did as recently as three, four, five years ago. The best way to sum up what I do is essentially Essentially, essentially, there we go, uh, I'm guinea pig in residence. It's, it's my job to experiment with new forms of reporting and new forms of social media. And so the reason why I don't have a title such as a reporter or host, editor, producer, etc., is because what I do is kind of all of those things, but none of those things at the same time. Because depending on the story I'm working on or the project I'm working on, I could be wearing any of those hats or uh, focusing on social media more from a business perspective or a software development perspective. Uh, and so I intentionally made sure that I had a job description that was as vague as possible. So it would allow me to experiment. And much of the work I've been doing over the last few years has focused specifically on Twitter. I'm actually approaching, uh, first of all, how many of you are on Twitter, just out of curiosity? Okay, easily three quarters of the room, if not more. So I first joined Twitter uh, in 2007, uh, February 2007. My very first tweet, like so many other people's tweeting, was about food. Uh, and so I was at home with my wife and my, and my daughter, who was about nine months old at the time, and my daughter Kaylee. So I wrote, watching Kaylee play in her extra saucer while Suzanne rips up some pita the hummus enjoying that hummus. Mm. <laughs> and so I share this with you just so you understand that not everything I tweet is about the news. Uh, but also because when I first got on Twitter in February 2007, none of us knew exactly what to make of this thing. Uh, I had been using online tools and had been part of online communities since I was a kid. The very first time I went online was sometime in 1984. Uh, I grew up near Cape Canaveral in Central Florida and, and happened to be part of a community where there were lots of geeks living there. And so at a very early age, I was exposed to online communities. And so for me, at least, when Twitter came around, it was just another one of these tools that had some promise, but we hadn't figured out how to use it yet. And it wasn't really until uh, about nine months later that it really struck me how Twitter could be used for breaking news, because in December of 2007, I remember uh, it was the holidays and I was at an airport with my family, and we were in the process of traveling to visit my mother-in-law out in Colorado, and I saw on Twitter someone saying they had heard a report that Benazir Bhutto from, from Pakistan, uh, someone had, had made an assassination attempt against her. And uh, I checked the websites on my phone of several news organizations, none of them were talking about it yet, so I started writing back and forth with people on Twitter to see what we could find out. And it didn't take too long, but eventually we found some people on Twitter who were in Pakistan and watching live television. And they were able to report to us that she had indeed been assassinated. And so all of this had occurred within a matter of maybe 20, 30 minutes before major news organizations, apart from a handful of them like the Associated Press, had gotten on top of the story. And it, it, it started making me wonder how we could use social, media in, uh, use social media in different ways. So over the next couple of years, I used Twitter uh, as a big part of NPR's election coverage for the, first, uh, for the 2008 presidential election, the first time uh, Barack Obama ran. And we used it for fact-checking presidential debates, for monitoring problems during voting, et cetera. Um, but then one day in December 2010, come on, there we go. Uh, I saw this hashtag, 
Now, how many of you know what a hashtag is? Okay, a decent number of you. Well, for those of you who don't, a hashtag is simply a word that people use on Twitter with a little hash mark or a pound sign in front of it to designate that it's a keyword of some sort to help make it easier for you to keep track of a conversation. And I saw some of these guys that I knew from Tunisia, some bloggers that they were using this hashtag, Sidi Bouzid, and I looked into it and, and quickly realized it was the name of a, of a small town in central Tunisia where a young man named Mohamed Bouazizi had set himself on fire to uh, protest uh, government officials confiscating his vegetable cart. Uh, he provided the only source of income for his family. He made something like $75 a week. And now that income was gone because he refused to pay a bribe to this government official. He set himself on fire um, and was rushed to a, a local medical clinic as, as locals came out to start protesting in solidarity for him. Well, in, in a country like Tunisia, stuff like that does not happen because there was no freedom of speech, no freedom of expression, no freedom of assembly allowed in the country at the time. Yet people started protesting in different places and began documenting it on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and elsewhere. And so while this was happening, um, I started tweeting about it. And, and a couple days before New Year's Eve, I, I, I tweeted, uh, following protests in Tunisia via the CD Bouzid hashtag, wonder if, the, wonder if the chances of all this leading to a jasmine revolution, don't know. Now, it, it, it occurred to me that while uh, I was writing this that men in Tunisia often wear a little sprig of jasmine flower in their hair, and often when you hear of revolutions, they often put a name with it related to a, a color or flower, so I thought I'd, I'd call it a jasmine revolution. Uh, but no one replied to my tweet because no one knew what on earth I was talking about. Uh, Tunisia isn't the sort of country that generally gets discussed in U.S. mainstream media. At best, if people know anything about Tunisia, they know that Star Wars, the Star Wars trilogies, were filmed there. I slept in Luke, Luke Skywalker's house, I'm absolutely serious. It, uh, if you ever have a chance to go to Tunisia, it's worth going just for that. Uh, but, uh, but for several weeks, apart from the Tunisians and a handful of news organizations, no one was covering it. But I was interested in it because I had spent time there and I knew people there, so I started monitoring it. The only problem is, is I don't speak Arabic. Uh, at the time, I, I, I didn't speak a word of it. And so I needed help from my Twitter followers for figuring out certain things. And so, um, for example, I sent out this tweet to a, uh, a, an activist I knew asking for his help, translating this. Now, this was a poster that someone was holding up at a rally. Uh, that's not real blood, it's fake blood. But I assumed it, what was written on it was a, a protest slogan of some sort. But because it was written into a photo, I, I couldn't use Google to translate it or anything like that. So I asked this guy uh, if he could help me translate it. What, what was fascinating is not only did I get a response, I got responses from other people. So for example, uh, I got this tweet from a Tunisian activist who goes by the name Rafik on Twitter. And he, he told me that it wasn't a protest slogan. It was actually the name of a young man, a protester who had been killed the day before. And so he told me this, and other people told me this, and yet other people told me this. And I, I started to realize that I didn't have to rely on just one or two people who happened to speak Arabic. It turns out there were lots of people on Twitter who were interested in helping me. I just needed to ask them more broadly. And so I started paying closer attention to what was going on in Tunisia and retweeting things that uh, were coming out of there. And the stuff you started seeing was quite incredible. Here's a particular tweet that was circulated on, on Twitter and Facebook. It's a person warning others in French that there are snipers located in the city of Gafsa. And she identifies certain places in the city, uh, the National uh, Guard headquarters, a hotel, a square, etc., where people had spotted sniper's nests. And so the protesters were actually rooting themselves around the sniper's nest because of the, the warnings they were receiving through social media. And all of this culminated uh, the second week in January when the president uh, of Tunisia, President Ben Ali, fled the country. It was the first successful popular uprising in the modern Arab world. And one of those, Twitter, one of those bloggers that I had met a number of years earlier in, tw in, on, in Tunisia, I saw him tweet, okay Arabs, you've seen how it's done in Tunisia, tag, you're it. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. He's basically throwing down to his compadres in other countries in the region to protest as well. 
Um, I didn't know if any of them were going to do it or if they were going to be successful, but, but just in case, I went into my, uh, my work calendar, my Microsoft Outlook calendar, and started blocking off random days in January and February, just in case things got interesting. And lo and behold, a couple days later, I started seeing tweets about this guy. This is Hosni Mubarak, who at the time was the uh, president of Egypt, and he had been in power for about 30 years. And uh, a number of, two, uh, of Egyptian protesters started circulating that they were going to organize a protest on January 25th, which happened to be National Police Day. Uh, so they thought that would be an ironic way of celebrating the day. And tens of, th tens of thousands of people came out that day. And within a matter of days, the protests turned in, essentially into a revolt as the police clamped down on them and, and, and started attacking the protesters. The only problem was is I really didn't know any Egyptians on the ground uh, who were going to be involved in the protests. Uh, and I wanted to spend that limited time that I had pulling together a network of sources. One of the few people I did know was this guy, Ella Abdel Fattah. Um, and he was, he was an Egyptian blogger who had been arrested several occasions before uh, for his human rights work. And he was actually living uh, in exile in, in South Africa at the time. But I, I knew who he was, I knew his history in the protest movement and his family's history in it. So I thought he would be a good starting point for, for finding sources. So uh, I knew he'd been on, on Twitter for a number of years, since about 2008, so he kind of predated the whole celebrity bubble on Twitter, uh, which, which probably meant that if you took a look at the people he was following, and you went all the way down to the bottom, you would find people that he actually knew in person. Because Twitter lists the people you follow in reverse chronological order. So the deeper you go in the list, the longer you've been following them. So I took a look at the people that he had first followed on Twitter, and I started following them as well. And I repeated this a couple of times until I created a Twitter list of maybe 30 or 40 people. And I started paying attention to the conversations that they were having with each other. Um, I noticed a variety of things. So for example, People would often use emoticons, smiley faces, and various things when talking to each other. They would swear at each other in English, very playfully, like they felt comfortable swearing at each other um, and making jokes. But then they would often drop other types of hints. So for example, here's a, a woman on Twitter who goes by the name Manal, and on January 29th she tweeted, uh, Layla Sawaif, my mother-in-law, is on Al Jazeera English right now, uh, voice only. A couple days later, I saw another tweet that caught my attention uh, that was similar. Uh-oh, news my mom, Dr. Layla Suwaif, has been arrested by Mubarak state security dogs. Notice it's the same name. Well, it turns out Allah and Manal, they're husband and wife. And this type of relationship popped up again and again and again while you monitored Twitter and other social media. I discovered that there were countless protesters on the ground who were husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, uh, uh, mothers and daughters, all sorts of different relationships. Not long after the Egyptian revolution, a, a sociologist took a, a large data dump of tweets from Egypt and analyzed them to map out the networks that existed between people. And so what you have here is all the people on the left in blue were people in Egypt that were tweeting in English and on the right were people who were tweeting in Arabic, and the ones that are in grades of purple were tweeting in a mix of the languages. What I found fascinating about this image when it was circulated after the revolution was that all the people in blue and a number of them in purple were essentially my entire Twitter list. And I didn't have the benefits of software to map this out for me. I simply followed the, the paper trail of conversations as they took place, and I was able to piece all of this together. So while there were battles happening in Tahrir Square, there would be dozens of people on the ground that I knew via Twitter who were reporting in real time what was happening, and I was able to keep track of them in such a way that I didn't think was possible before. And by doing this, it essentially gave me a type of situational awareness. In other words, it almost felt like I was in a virtual helicopter flying over Tahrir Square which you need to uh, understand, Tufker Square is not some, some little uh, uh, a public square in a city. It is a vast um, traffic circle that can fit probably 10 cars across and then continues further north. It's an area about the size of one square mile. So you can fit hundreds of thousands of people in this space. So when a battle's going on, it gets very, very messy. 
But nonetheless, because I, had gotten, I was able to identify these people on the ground and gotten to know them through Twitter, it gave me that sense that I could picture what was happening across this battlefield in real time in a way that I couldn't if I had been standing smack in the middle of Tucker Square while all this was going on. Now, fast forward about a week after um, Mubarak resigned, actually a matter of days after Mubarak resigned, and word started spreading that protests were going to happen in Libya. Now, Libya was not the type of place that had protests, because if you had protests, they would kill you. It was simple as that. Uh, Gaddafi had been in office since 1968. To give you some historical perspective, imagine if Richard Nixon were still president as of a year and a half ago. Not passing judgment or anything, but just imagine it. <laughs> that was essentially the circumstance in, in, in Libya, except for the fact that not only was he still in power, he would, he would murder all his enemies and hold public hangings in soccer stadiums, and it just... As, if you think of the quintessential crazy dictator, this is your guy. But nonetheless, people started organizing protests. And so I started interacting with my Twitter followers to figure out what was going on. They started sending me videos saying that these were protests from different cities in, in, in parts of, of the country. But a lot of editors were uh, at news organizations didn't trust this footage. No one had seen protests in Libya before. But my Twitter followers, Excuse me, they started watching these videos. They listened for accents. They looked for landmarks. They would debate each other and say, okay, is that an Eastern Libyan accent or a Western Libyan accent? That building looks a lot like the courthouse in Benghazi. Let's see if we can find it on Google Maps. And so, even though I had a fairly limited amount of knowledge when it came to Libya, people came out of the woodwork to help me and share their knowledge about the country, whether they were Libyan Americans or were interested in the history of the Middle East or North Africa they were able to help me pull together a decent amount of, uh, amount of understanding to what was going on. So to give you an example of, of what we were able to do, um, let's see, in this particular case, in March, I received a tweet from um, some, someone in Egypt asking me to take a look at a photo. And so I clicked it open and this is what it was. Some uh, Libyan revolutionary holding a large artillery shell with a lot of markings on it that didn't mean anything to me. And it turns out that a regional uh, news network was claiming that this photo was proof that Israel had secretly supplied weapons to Gaddafi, and they were able to prove it because there was a six-pointed star on their artillery shell. Now, that struck me as really, really strange. So I tweeted, for argument's sake, let's say Israel sold mortars to Libya. Would they be so dumb as to put a Star of David on them? Probably not. So I asked my Twitter followers to research it, and within a matter of minutes, they started diving into this image, taking apart everything they saw. What did these symbols mean? What did these abbreviations mean? And pretty quickly, we determined that I-L-L-U-M was short for illumination, or illumination round. In other words, it was a shell that's launched up in the sky at night, and it has chemicals in it that, that catch fire and lights up the sky, so you can see what's going on on the ground. And we surmised that the six-pointed star was some sort of symbol to convey that it was a star shell or an illumination round. So even though we were pretty sure that meant it probably wasn't from Israel, but we better do our due diligence. And my Twitter followers started finding images all over the place. This came from an arms fair in India, an Indian manufacturer of illumination rounds. And they had a very similar symbol, not exactly the same, but pretty similar. Uh, someone found a schematic of an illumination round, also with a six-pointed star, from 1914, almost a hundred years ago from World War I. And we kept digging and digging until finally one of my Twitter followers found a declassified NATO manual from a few years ago that showed all of the various symbols that you could put on artillery. And if you flipped over to page 27 or whatever it was, here was a page showing how you would use a six-pointed star in different configurations and colors to show that you had an illumination round. So we shared all of this on Twitter, but it got reported by Al Jazeera and several other regional news networks for weeks. And we, each time it was reported, we had to share all of this information once again and show them, folks, this is debunked. And that my, 
motley group of Twitter followers were able to disprove this in about an hour, while other news networks just ran with it blindly. Now, let's take a look at Syria for a moment. Syria is by far the ugliest case we've seen so far in the um, Arab Spring. Over 60,000 people have died in the last two years in the civil war that's erupted there. Early on, though, it was very hard to know what was going on because there weren't many Western reporters there. And a lot of news organizations relied on uh, a blogger who was based in Damascus who went by the blog Gay Girl in Damascus. Her name was Amina Arak. And she was a Syrian-American woman, um, a lesbian woman, who had moved from the US to Syria a few months before the revolution began. And news organizations such as The Guardian interviewed her in person to, uh, to learn about her story. And she became a go-to source for many news organizations. And then one day in June of 2011, she was kidnapped. And word spread like wildfire that she had been kidnapped. And people started organizing online and offline protests. This is a picture that circulated all over Facebook. People made posters out of this and actually brought them to Syrian embassies and protested in front of them. And there was this mad dash to figure out what was going on. Well, I started asking around on Twitter if any of my followers knew her so I could interview them. And a lot of people did say they knew her and they'd known her for years, but none of them had met her in person. So I said, okay, do any of you know her and have met her in person? And no one responded. So then I asked again, uh, do any of you know people who might have met her in person? And they didn't. And then eventually I heard from a, uh, a guy I knew living in Damascus who was connected to the local gay and lesbian community. And he told me, I'm asking about that uh, today, most of the day, and I have some solid connection in the lesbian scene here in Damascus. No one knows her. So I started digging into the possibility that maybe she was really deep in the closet or undercover in some way, and it was going to be very difficult to track who she was. Uh, but I couldn't find anyone <coughs> apart from those news organizations who claimed to have met her in person. And so uh, I started contacting the news organizations to see what they could help me with. And I got, in, I got a hold of um, The Guardian and waited to hear back from one of their reporters. While I waited, uh, word got out that the photo that had been used in that protest uh, sign wasn't of this woman, Amina Arak. In fact, it was a photo of a woman on Facebook named Yelena Lecic, a Croatian woman living in London. And when I heard back from the reporter at The Guardian, she told me that they had talked to each other on Skype by texting each other, and then had scheduled to meet, meet each other in person in Damascus. But Amina didn't show up. And so the reporter went back to her office and contacted Amina, again, texting her through Skype. And Amina said, I was being followed, we were both gonna be arrested, we can't do this, I don't wanna be a part of this story. And the reporter said, don't worry, I've got enough material uh, to do the interview. And she published it, and the, the, um, uh, the final version that went online um, claimed that they had met in person when they hadn't. And so I asked the reporter, well, how would you know what Amina looked like when you were supposed to meet her in person? And she said, oh, Amina sent me this photo which meant only one thing, that Amina never meant to meet her in the first place. So over the course of the week, I partnered with a group of bloggers and some other reporters as we dug deeper and deeper into this, tracing her footprint online, talking to people that she had contacted through traditional mail uh, and other methods, until it finally got to the point that we found out that Amina Araf, not only was she not Yelena Lechich, she was a dude named Tom McMasters. Uh, Tom McMasters is an American from Stone Mountain, Georgia, who was studying at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And he had been playing this character online for at least six years. And initially, uh, he said he created her as a way of, of participating in conversations about the Arab-Palestinian conflict, or the Israeli-Palestinian Palestinian conflict. He thought he'd be taken more seriously if he were a uh, Syrian-American. Uh, Syrian now, what caused him then to decide to make this character gay and then start posting lesbian erotic poetry and then posting personal ads on, on gay websites? Who knows? But nonetheless, he got himself caught into this web of lies 
that was so successful that people started to actually question whether other bloggers in the region were real. And it made it very difficult to cover Syria for a number of months because no one trusted anyone anymore. Now, I want to go to questions in a couple of minutes, so I want to wrap this up um, with a, a story about how I finally made it to Egypt after all of this. I had promised my wife early on that I wasn't going to travel in the region as long as bullets were flying. I have no experience as a combat reporter, and I had no desire to learn it on a job. And so when things began to settle down in Egypt, I decided, I, I decided to go teach a journalism workshop there and use that as an opportunity to meet with some of the protesters. And so we all got together one night at a cafe, and as I'm hanging out with 30 or 40 of these protesters, we started hearing pop, 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 pop in the background. And all of them immediately whipped out their phones and started looking at them. And I asked, what's going on? And without even looking up, they just kind of muttered to me, tear gas. And so those were tear gas canisters blowing up in the distance. And it, they quickly found out that a group of, of, of family members of protesters who had been killed, so these were the family members of martyrs, essentially, they had been protesting and were trying to hold a rally and the police had blocked them. And it turned into a fight. And now several thousand people had gathered at Tahrir Square and it was escalating quickly. And so within five minutes, everyone at the cafe with me left. The first wave went because they wanted to defend people in the square. So these were people who were gonna uh, chop up uh, the sidewalk and make them into bricks, prepared to throw them at police. The second group left a few minutes later because they were the ones with the camera phones and they wanted to stream what was happening and document what was going on. The third group was around six people standing around staring at me wondering what I was gonna do because they felt it was their duty to make sure that I didn't get myself killed because they knew I, had, I didn't know what I was doing when it came to any type of, of reporting from the field. But they agreed to walk with me towards Tahrir Square and we would take it kind of one block at a time. And the closer we got, the thicker the tear gas got. I'd never experienced tear gas before. I didn't know the, the way it would first hit your eyes, then it would get into your nasal passages, and then you would taste it after a while. It was, uh, it, it was kind of like snorting a line of wasabi, it was just absolutely horrible, horrible. Would not recommend it. Um, and then we got closer and closer until we realized we were actually caught between police lines. In front of us were police facing the other way, swinging their batons, and rocks were flying over them towards us. Behind us, you know, 20, 30 years behind us, were more police, some of whom had been injured and were being treated, others who had their batons and were waiting to go in and kick some butt. So we were literally caught between the police lines. And that's a very bad position to be in if you want to be there with a camera and a, and a, and a cell phone. So I had to stand there very quietly, occasionally checking my phone as best I could to tweet what I was seeing. Um, and it was absolute chaos. Uh, you know, I, could, I could see the protests and the fighting right in front of me. I could hear the noise and the, and the water cannon shooting off. I could smell and I could taste the tear gas in mouth, my mouth. Yet I had no idea what on earth was actually going on. I just couldn't tell beyond my immediate frame of reference. You know, 50 yards in one direction, 50 yards in the other, and that was it. I knew there were a lot of people in Tahrir Square, but I couldn't tell if it was 1,000 people or 10,000 people. And it wasn't until we were able to sneak out of there and I was able to get a strong enough phone signal to see what people were tweeting that everything suddenly came back into focus. It was that virtual helicopter again. Uh, and it turns out that 5,000 people were being attacked by police and more than 1,000 of them were injured that night. And I was only able to get a small taste of it because of where I was trapped. And it really gave me a strong sense of both the strengths and limitations of different types of reporting. On the one hand, it was a very visceral experience being there in person and being able to see the adrenaline and the fear in people's eyes. But at the same time, my understanding was limited because I was very boxed in. Once I got online, I couldn't look people in the eyes anymore, but I could talk to a lot more people at the same time in a broader field of battle. And so both methods gave me a very different but complementary understanding of ways we could cover this particular conflict. Now, uh, before we go into questions, where do we take this from here? One of the things I've been trying to do is figure out how I can work with software developers to tell new types of stories when we're able to get access to these types of tweets. Uh, one day, a group of us sat down just on a lark and ex wanted to figure out over the course of three hours what we could come up with. And 
one group of people took like about 50,000 of my tweets from 2011 and started mapping them out and they were able to pinpoint them on different maps of the region and color code them based on density over periods of time. And then they connected them to a database of the tweets as well as headlines coming out. So you could zoom in on a particular day, such as June 3rd, 2011, when there was an assassination attempt against the president of, of Yemen and, and get a sense of what people were tweeting, the intensity of tweeting and what we were reporting at the time. We also decided to take a very microscopic look and we looked at a snapshot of my tweets from a 12 hour period in Tahrir Square in Cairo and started mapping out their location, either because the, the tweets were tagged with geographic information or people were saying, I'm standing in front of the Sadat metro station or something like that. We also coded it by what the person was doing, were they a protester, were they a reporter, by the emotions they were conveying, by what they were experiencing. And it gave you a whole new way of digging into the tweets from that day rather than this live stream of information flooding us. Uh, but this is really just the beginning. I've been able to figure out a variety of ways of using social media to cover the Arab Spring. And, and I guess as a continuation of that, how to use it in breaking news in general, from natural disasters to the Newtown shooting. Uh, it also works really well in the presidential elections. But what about for other types of news topics? Could we use it to cover climate change, crime reporting, medical reporting? Honestly, I don't know, and the reason I don't know is, like I said at the beginning of this talk, this type of reporting didn't exist a few years ago. My type of job did not exist in the newsroom, and now, that the, now there are people doing similar things at the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Reuters, and many other news organizations. But the only way we're really gonna figure out how to use this type of reporting is if we really try to experiment and, and encourage a culture of experimentation in the newsroom, because otherwise if we don't, it's gonna remain a small, isolated form of journalism that people like me are able to do simply because we're able to get away with it. Thank you very much.